And thank you. We're in between uh, us and lunch, so I guess we makes us part of the supply chain too. So uh, at least it's not happy hour. <laughs> so uh, Patrick, uh, you're also the vice president of crops, commodities, and ingredients at Treehouse Foods. But uh, I want to let you introduce yourself and your journey that includes the University of Illinois. So tell us a little bit about you. Sure. I grew up in uh, Ashton, Illinois, which is northern Illinois, so it's a small town of a thousand people. So I came to University of Illinois, graduated in uh, 96, uh, had a degree in animal science, so I'm using that well today. Um, I started my career with uh, Cargill, uh, started at the Board of Trade as a, as a simple runner, and spent 14 years with them doing grain merchandising, risk management. Um, we spent a lot of time on risk management with farmers, so that developed into risk management with consumers as well. Um, after 14 years with Cargill, I had an opportunity to go over to Treehouse Foods. I've been with Treehouse Foods for 11 years. Um, as Herman mentioned before, Treehouse Foods is a company that you guys probably have not have heard of. We are the private label manufacturer. We're one of the largest in the world. Uh, we deal directly with a lot of the, the main retailers that you're very familiar with. Uh, we have 42 plants across the United States, Canada, as well as two pasta plants in Italy. Um, just by show of hands, if, if you've ever gone to Costco and got pretzels that are filled with peanut butter, we make those. Um, but we make anything shelf stable for the most part. So it's salad dressing, cookie dough, pretzels, crackers, uh, non-dairy creamer, um, a lot of pasta, and um, we're continuing to grow. Yeah, well, that was going to be my second question in terms of uh, telling us a little bit about, more about private, private label foods. And, and I guess Treehouse is, is a big, a big part of that. But, you know, uh, COVID has brought supply chains conversation now at every table, right? We all know about, uh, um, about supply chains because of, of COVID and the disruptions that we have suffered. But, and, but we know very little bits and pieces about it. We don't know much about it. And, you know, there was, a, in, in our previous talk, there was a little bit of conversations ab about that. Could you tell us a little bit about the essentials of uh, supply chains and uh, especially related to your company and also related to, to technology in general? So I think when COVID broke out, I don't think anyone knew how long it was going to last. I specifically remember us being sent home and... It was about two weeks later after sitting in my basement at the poker room table and my poker chair and my back was killing me. I was like, I need to go get my monitors. I need to get my, de my desk chair. I think I'm going to be here for a while. So two years later, um, we've kind of figured out what has, how has COVID affected us as a company but also us as an economy. Uh, I would say we literally hit the brakes on a car, which is the supply chain across the worldwide. And... I think from that moment when we hit the brakes, everyone was reeling and trying to figure out how to get supplies from overseas to the United States, from the United States domestically, from plant to plant, to location to location. It was difficult. So um, people were not sure what consumers were going to do as far as eating. Uh, we, had, we were relying on data quite a bit as far as what we knew from the past, but now that everyone was working from home, we didn't know what people were going to do. But we start seeing some early trends early on. We started seeing people load up on pasta, easy, easy meal to make. We saw people loading up on non-dairy creamer, which is just a simple powder, right? We, we found out later that people were doing that for bomb shelters, right? They, it was something that they could do to make milk, literally, for long term, if that was the case for COVID. Um, but we saw a lot of shelf-stable items that were flying off the shelf, whether it's crackers, things like that. We make a lot of salad dressing. But our salad dressing sales started to drop. So to Martha's point earlier about fresh vegetables, fresh vegetable supply chain got jammed up pretty quick. So all of a sudden, our, we saw our salad dressing sales drop a little bit. So we had to kind of do some gut checks during COVID as far as what we perceived what the consumer might do. Um, now that we're kind of getting out of COVID, uh, the supply chain's still having to kind of figure out things as, as well. We are still trying to figure out on the data analytics as far as what, the, what our customers want. So our customers might be a Walmart, Target, Costco, um, but we're trying to determine what they need and are requesting on a monthly basis because 
their data is not good as, as well. They're still trying to figure out what consumer habits are going to be over the next you know, few months. Um, but also, outside of COVID, we're still dealing with supply chain issues. So we're dealing with a lot of things that we cannot get from overseas, so that's been difficult. Um, a lot of the fresh vegetables. Uh, we're one of the biggest producers of pickles in the, in the world. So you can imagine during COVID, when you have pickles being harvested in Mexico, once they're harvested, you have about three to four days to get them processed. So as they were getting harvested, we were being, getting reports from our three uh, pickle plants that we don't have labor. We, don't have, we can't manufacture these, these pickles. We can't process them. So all of a sudden, we had fresh vegetables that were needed to be processed in a certain time frame that are expensive in the first place that we would have a difficulty as far as with labor, um, with just the, the whole supply chain. And, and basically, what we're trying to do is prevent as much, you know, dollars being wasted more than anything in regards to the, f the whole food uh, supply chain. That's an excellent point. I, I, I was puzzled by Martha's comment on, on the, our butt taste and uh, the change in demand. Uh, and I was wondering if you can give us your own insight about, you know, your company um, being so broad around the world and an opportunity to respond to that comment in terms of, do you see that evolving? Uh, you know, the changes or the demands will continue to be, we're so used to get, you know, maybe pasta from uh, at Costco from Italy or um, this from, you know, this particular coffee from Sumatra, stuff like that. Is that how, how do you see that evolving in terms of uh, the, the demand from this world from all of those different products that come from all over? So I'll kind of touch a little bit on private label and kind of evolve into the question. So when I first joined Treehouse, I didn't know what private label was and they kind of explained it. And my response was, oh, you mean generic? And I just about got fired the first day. So, but <laughs> I remember when you go shopping with your, with your parents as a, as a kid, you know, generic was the yellow packaging, bottom shelf, said sugar, said flour, right? Private label is a lot sexier now, right? It's, you go to Walmart, it's their great value. You see their great value of ranch dressing right next to Hidden Valley ranch dressing. You tried both of them, I bet you couldn't tell a difference, right? But you look at the label, one's $3, one's $1.50. Private label's cheaper. So that, we replicate that across about 30 different brands across the whole storefront, across major, major uh, areas. Europe is big in the private label. So uh, we are basically replicating what we see in Europe in the United States. So we're, we see private label growing overall, and it's back to the consumer, right? So if, if, if you like Smucker's jelly versus a private label jelly, that's your preference, but there's also a difference or a delta between price. So a lot of that comes from, it's still the same ingredients, still the same supply chains, it's just, it might be a matter of marketing, things like that as far as advertising different margin uh, expansion levels as well. So um, I still see private label growing as a whole. Um, I think consumers are being more specific. They're eating healthier. They're demanding clean label. Um, they're demanding where's my food coming from as well. So we buy a lot of palm oil uh, from Indonesia. So a lot of the questions we get is, the palm oil that you're buying, is it sustainable? And then the second question we usually get is, are there any concerns with child labor? So those kind of questions coming from our retailers are very concerning to us because obviously a retailer does not want that bad press if a uh, palm oil plantation were to have a labor issue in regards to the children. So we're, we're conscious of that. Um, and then we're, so overall we're, we're very cognizant as far as what the consumer wants, what the retailer wants, and then it's our job to basically deliver that for them. And uh, along those issues that you mentioned, and there was a lot of conversation this morning about carbon, right, and being carbon uh, carbon neutral at some point. Are there any efforts in the supply chains, of, particularly in your company, to not only address issues of uh, child labor or um, certain practices uh, for growing crops, but in terms of certifying or giving value to your product through some sort of carbon carbon neutral label? Yeah, I think 10 years ago when I joined, um, sustainability came up and it was not a big 
priority for Treehouse, I would say. Now, you cannot actually have a conversation with the retailer that doesn't bring up sustainability, doesn't bring up something around um, environmental as well. So we're hearing a lot more conversations about that. That's being driven directly from the consumer. So they're, the, the retailers are thinking forward and thinking into the future as far as what the consumers are going to want from us. We are basically taking all of our 42 plants and it's literally a, a, an overall internal audit. What items do we buy? So we buy a lot of soybean oil, we buy a lot of corn syrup, we buy a lot of wheat, durum, palm oil, coconut oil, and trying to determine what our carbon footprint is on all those commodities. It's not an easy task at all, right? So you're going all the way back to the farmer level, domestically, but also internationally as well. So uh, we're determining the traceability, but also the sustainability as well on that regard. We're also looking at the whole carbon footprint in regards to our plants, what we can do. Um, literally on a conference call yesterday about all the, 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 the levels of different assessments on the scopes. So we are digging deep into it because we know that's what the consumer wants. If we don't do it as a, as a company, someone else will do it and will take our spot. So we can't let that happen. So we have to make sure we keep up as far as what the retailers want, but also what the consumer wants as well. So the consumer demands those uh, characteristics, but we also in the middle of uh, inflation, uh, prices of food are going up, uh, supply chains, uh, we're ending up, uh, hopefully ending a, a, a pandemic, but war has started in Europe and um, there are all these ingredients going there. So how, uh, tell me about the effect of price and all, all of the things and how the supply chains will affect the prices coming up for the just the consumer here in the United States or around the world. Yeah, so as I mentioned before, I mean, um, there's, a, there's a difference between branded versus private label. So um, we have, I'll tell you this, we have much smaller margins. So, so when we have uh, see an escalation in, in our input costs, whether it's in commodities, ingredients, in packaging, labor, we immediately have to go out and talk to our customers as far as, and our customers being the retailers, about passing along that price. Um, we're on our fourth round of doing that with a lot of our major retailers, and I know the consumers are probably starting to feel that pinch as well. Um, you guys see it at the gas pump every day, especially this week, right? So that price is changing faster than what we see in food prices. But food, food inflation is obviously real. Um, it is, will probably sustain for a while until commodity and ingredient prices come down. Um, but I think what we're trying to do as a company, what customers are trying to do for them as well are trying to reverse engineer. How do we avoid buying expensive items? How do we avoid buying customized ingredients that are expensive? How do we use less ingredients in order to you know, help the, the consumer out as well? Because at the end of the day, if the consumer so stops buying certain products, it hits, hits the retailer, the retailer comes back to us. So it is a domino effect. So at some point, we're gonna have to do our part as far as trying to figure out how to re-engineer, how to make things cheaper and still have good food quality, safe, safe food, but on also how do we pass that back down to the consumer as well. So do you see uh, what are the parts of the supply chain that you think they will remain or what are the things that could change to reduce price or, or make it more efficient? And part of the question also, do you see technologies that are needed for that? I think the biggest area of concern that we have is around logistics. So if, if we've got product available, it's hard to find a truck driver today to go from point A to point B as readily as it was probably three to four years ago. A lot of it has to do with the age of the truck drivers today. I think the average age is around close to 60 years old. Um, a lot of truck drivers want to be at home. Um, the, the government also instituted electronic logging, so you know, driver, truck drivers, for safety reasons, can only drive so many hours or so many miles in a day. So I think in, in regards to technology, um, I, 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 I'm always looking at the you know, driverless vehicles. It's hard to believe that that can actually happen. Um, but you, you think and talk about Amazon and what they've done with their supply chain. And I, I remember three or four years ago when they talked about having drones dropping off stuff at people's doorstep and people laughed, right? That's not that far off if, if, if it's not happening today. Um, it's not uncommon to hear people seeing people driving cars and they're not driving them, right? So 
It's a little bit like the Jetsons, um, so I think it's coming. Um, but it's going to be several years ahead, uh, but I, I think technology like that can only help us, um, especially on the human aspect side. Um, it, it's difficult to get people to work, as Martha mentioned before. We, we do a lot of uh, fresh crop vegetables, and it's hard to get labor, and we depend on labor not only domestically, but also from uh, overseas, or actually from the, uh, Mexico as well, that they come up legally um, into a, uh, Wisconsin and the Midwest during our pickle season to help with the crop. So that's hard work. We need to figure out different ways to make that easier, um, and it's going to have to be technology that has to lead that way. So just to, before we go to a question, just one more, that this is self-serving, but what would you tell uh, current and future students that are in agriculture or want to get into food and agriculture from your perspective about the opportunities in the world food system? I think there's, agriculture is amazing because, I mean, it's, if everyone, if everyone eats, right? So everyone can be affected by agriculture in some way. So whether you're in the school of ag or, or in business or in actuarial science. So there's a lot of opportunity whether you want to go into the food business or not. Um, I guess my advice, and someone mentioned it before, but the food industry or the ag industry is a small industry. But my word of advice, I guess, to students that are trying to get jobs is the network. Um, people do it all the time on Facebook, right? So if you're a friend of a friend or on LinkedIn, you're a friend of a friend, having those connections go a long way. Um, if you're out looking for a job, and I think we had talked about it before, you can't simply just drop a resume anymore. You've got to have an in. You've got to be able to have a network. You have to have a connection to somebody. But you also have to have a passion in order to, to get to that next step. So I think having the passion and also the networking goes a long way as far as finding your interest and finding a career in agriculture. Thank you, Pat, very much. And I think we've got time for a few questions. Uh, Patrick Herman, thank you very much. Very interesting conversation. So uh, one element you mentioned, Patrick, is that um, desire for more sustainable uh, food, and it's obviously linked to the supply chain. But at the same time, we could argue that we are very far from uh, very transparent eco-labeling, basically telling you, you know, that piece of meat you're about to enjoy is based on that much quantity of water or that much CO2 as needed throughout the entire supply chain to make it happen. You could eventually compare that piece of meat, uh, say red meat versus, you know, chicken, and take your decision as a consumer. So my question is, what in your view is kind of, uh, you know, slowing us down towards making those environmental content of the food we eat very transparent? Is it the industry which is not so much for it? Or is it because consumers do not realize we could actually get that information to them? What do you think? It's a good question. Um, you know, honestly, I think it, it's a long process. It's a long way to get there. Um, I look at coffee. So we do single serve coffee, you know, Keurig machines. The, the way that people buy coffee specifically is they want to hear the story about the coffee, right? They want to see where it's coming from, the, tra the, the traceability of all the way back to Colombia. But they also want to know where, what area in Colombia that, that came from. But they also want to feel good about buying that coffee that came from Colombia that also might be helping the local farmer, right? Making sure that they're, they're getting, you know, the, the right wages for their labor, that they're doing sustainable practices, things like that. So it, that's part of the marketing aspect of it. The other portion of it, too, is it's cost as well. So there's, there are certain areas where, and it doesn't sound like that would be expensive at all, but in regards to how do you tell that story, how do you convey that story to a consumer, to make sure that they latch on and, and buy more of that specific skew or that specific coffee, that gets to be the difficult aspect because all of a sudden you're talking about changing all your, your labels, you can change your packaging, but then also you've got to have to tell a story. But what if that story comes up and it's not accurate, right? So they want to make sure that they have a full, solid story that that won't come back on them as well. So I think part of it is time. I think it will come. Um, there's a lot of work being done as far as, you know, the traceability as far as where oils are coming from, where coconut oil, palm oil, but even domestically, where corn is being harvested from, what states, what's the carbon footprint on Joe's farmer's ground, and I think that's the differential for farmers as well, is how, how's a farmer going to differentiate themselves from their neighbor, and it's going to be through programs like that, working with suppliers that 
hey, I use environmentally safe practices farming corn versus my neighbor. But part of that also is how do I tell that story to my supplier? How does my supplier tell that story to a Walmart, right? That, that can kind of come full circle. And it's going to take time. It's going to take, you know, resources as well. There's a question. So uh, whatever happened to the RFID traceability technology? On the Keurig? Oh, RFIDs, the small little reading chips that were going to be put in food at the very beginning or put with animals and be tra traced to the uh, user? Yeah, I'm not quite familiar with that. I'm sorry. I've heard of it, but I, I don't know where we're at as far as the status of it. Sorry. Any other questions or oh, we're all hungry so um, all right thank you very much pat and enjoy lunch great job